Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. John Ku. I am a professor of dermatology at UCSF Department of Dermatology in San Francisco. I'm also board certified in psychiatry and dermatology. And thank you for joining me. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about practical psychodermatology. And uh, the, the reason I think this is uh, important lecture, hopefully for you, is because for some of you, I'm not even sure if you ever get any lecture on psychodermatology in your entire residency. And this is because the number of people who are both uh, expert in psychodermatology and happy to see these types of patients, including delusional patients, probably less than the number of fingers in your two hands across US. And there's 143 dermatology residency program. Only two of them uh, has uh, somebody who is a faculty who's board certified in psychiatry and dermatology. So psychodermatology is something that I think is very important in your practice, but you might not have too much opportunity to learn about. Uh, even American Academy of Dermatology meeting, the last live meeting we had, 2019 uh, AAD, there were 343 sessions offered and only one set of those sessions were about psychodermatology. And, and a lot of this is because once again, there's not that many people who are specialized in psychodermatology and happy to teach as well as see these kind of patients. So what I'm trying, going to try to do is to give you overview of psychodermatology. The first part, I'm just going to give you a taste of what psychodermatology consists of because it's a whole field, it's not one disease. And then the, the last part, I'm going to focus in detail on how to manage patients with delusions of parasitosis which is also called delusional infestation or Morgellons disease, because that's one condition that is very difficult for every practitioner. And it's not an uncommon condition. So all of you sooner or later will probably have to deal with these patients if you haven't already. So let me go ahead and get started. I have no conflict of interest because uh, there is no sponsor for psychodermatology to have conflict of interest with. Now, this is a cartoon where somebody is about to jump off a building and there's a policeman with a dermatologist. And the caption, which got cut off, uh, said, we cannot find a psychiatrist, but we found a dermatologist. Do you have anything wrong with your skin? And this is the kind of situation that happens frequently uh, in our practice when we wish that a patient such as with delusions of parasitosis, go see a psychiatrist or at least some kind of a mental health professional. But in fact, they want to come see us instead. Oh, by the way, if any of you ever wonder who is Dr. Nicholas Brownstone, uh, whose picture you see right below me, he's my fellow. And he's helping me to do this whole thing, including to record this lecture. Now, uh, psychodermatology, as I mentioned, is not one disease, but a whole field. Uh, probably the most common condition is skin disorders precipitated or exacerbated by stress. And that includes psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, acne. Sometimes I feel that almost any inflammatory condition of the skin can be worsened by stress. But even some non-inflammatory condition, or at least not inflammation visible to the eyes, such as alopecia areata, are thought to be also caused by stress in some patients. And then uh, there's a psychological impact of disfigurement. Because skin is visible, many patients feel awful, their self-esteem is devastated, their body image suffered, and people can end up with depression, anxiety, social phobia. There are also people who have psychogenic excoriations, delusions of parasitosis, even pruritus, uh, which is the number one symptom in dermatology. How miserable people are has a lot to do with the patient's mental status. And personality disorder might also be important, especially 
if you do cosmetic uh, procedures as part of your practice. Because there are so many different conditions, it is good to separate apples from orange. And this is how I do it. Psychodermatological conditions come in four different uh, big categories. First, psychophysiologic disorders, which is on the left. That is skin conditions that are real, but can be frequently exacerbated or even precipitated by stress. Second, primary psychiatric disorders. These are people whose problem is primarily psychiatric. There's nothing really wrong with their skin, hair, or nail. And these are the people with delusions of parasitosis, factitial dermatitis, psychogenic excoriation, and so forth. Uh, third is the secondary psychiatric disorder. These are people who suffer emotional, social, sometimes even occupational damage by the fact that uh, they have skin disease, real skin disease. And then lastly, cutaneous sensory disorders. There are many patients who come to dermatologists with sensations on the skin, ranging from crawling and biting, burning, electric shock kind of uh, sensations, all kinds of disagreeable sensations. And a lot of times neurologists give up on these people and then, then end up coming to dermatologists. Uh, traditional dermatology remedies like topical steroids generally don't do much. However, the, the use of things like Neurontin or um, uh, tricyclic antidepressants tend to be helpful. So those are different categories of psychodermatological conditions. On the other hand, uh, the other way to understand psychodermatology is the nature of underlying psychiatric problem. And most of these, the best way to find out is just ask, are you anxious? Are you depressed? Uh, do you have obsessive compulsive tendency? Now the fourth one, psychosis. You really cannot ask, are you psychotic? Because people who are psychotic typically have very little insight and they don't know that they're psychotic or delusional. So the, uh, psychosis, you have to be very diplomatic. And lastly, personality disorders, once again, which is important, especially in cosmetic practice, borderline narcissistic personality disorders. So psychophysiologic disorders, people with psoriasis, people with atopic dermatitis, many people report that stress make it worse. There was a study done by Dr. Grismier decades ago, documenting what percent of patients reported that emotional trigger was important in the natural cause of their skin disease. And as you can see, hyperhidrosis, it's like 100%. Like in Simplex Chronicus, 98% of the patients said stress was important, psoriasis 62% with different incubation time. The building in the front is UCSF Psoriasis Treatment Center, where, I, uh, where I'm a, a director. And this is where we do Gekamen treatment for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, generalized pregonodularis. Uh, believe it or not, we still do this treatment. But the other part of the treatment is like relaxation because many of these people do find relief when they learn to relax more effectively. This is a patient with hyperhidrosis who failed many uh, usual treatments. And then eventually the case was referred to me because the, the last dermatologist he was, uh, met, uh, he was seen realized that the patient was having this uh, sweating attack secondary to anxiety attacks. So we really could not help the patient unless somebody do something about his anxiety attack. So I started him on Alprazolam. Uh, the old brand name is Xanax. And his sweating attack improved greatly, but he was still having a little breakthrough sweating attacks because he was having little breakthrough anxiety attacks since medications like Alprazolam only works for a couple hours. If he forget to take the next dose, he could have another attack. So I added a low dose of doxepin, like 25 milligrams per day. And low dose doxepin works very much like anti-anxiety agent without being um, addictive. So on those two medications, his hyperhidrosis 
uh, was completely under control. Eventually, I was able to win off both medications without recurrence. So sometimes you, you just have to um, find out what's causing the problem as opposed to just looking at the skin. Buspirone, Buspa, this is one of the most benign medication any dermatologist can try his or hand on in terms of psychopharmacology. The usual dose is five to 10 milligram twice a day to four times a day. Uh, this is a non-sedating anti-anxiety agent that is also non-addictive. The side effects are, are quite uh, rare and uh, I cannot think of any serious side effect uh, with buspirone, uh, but it takes about a month for the anti-anxiety effect to kick in. So the patient need to be patient uh, when they uh, prescribe alprazolam. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the abuse by Ron. Now alprazolam or Xanax, this is um, much more quick acting benzodiazepine and the dosing uh, to be very conservative uh, because I can totally understand if you feel nervous about using any of these medications. Start with 0.25 milligram, that's the smallest dose available. You can even have the patient cut it in half. So half of 0.25 milligram is 0.125 milligram. And it could be used like three times a day and gradually increase the dose, titrate up by as little as 0.125, which is half a tablet or 0.25 milligram until you find the dose that actually cut the anxiety seriously down, but not to make the patient sedated. Now, alprazolam is a medication that can be addictive because it's benzodiazepine. So as soon as the anxiety is under control and eventually then slowly uh, think about planning to taper the patient off. Now, paroxetine, Paxil, and that's a SSRI antidepressant, but it's also anti-anxiety agent in the dose of 10 to 20 milligrams per day. It's also a good anti-anxiety agent and it has official FDA approval for that. Now, primary psychiatric disorders, this is where the main condition is psychiatric. Um, there is real, really no skin problem, no nail problem, no hair problem. Some of them are caused by depression. Sometimes when people are really depressed, they get agitated instead of having retarded depression. Agitated depression, means people become restless, they become cranky. They, they, and then those people sometimes pick on their skin. This is an example of somebody who was very depressed, but uh, more agitated. And this is another lady who was also depressed and was picking on her skin. Now, you notice that there is a sparing of uh, the, the skin on both sides of her back almost like in the shape of the wing of butterfly. Sometimes this is referred to as butterfly sign. And this is because those are the areas that people have hard time reaching. Real skin disease doesn't care if you can reach or not. Whereas the self-induced lesion tend to occur uh, mostly on an easily reachable area. For example, extensor side of the arm, uh, you often see the lesions you rarely see the uh, lesions in the medial aspect of the arm. If it were leg, you often see lesions on the extensor and anterior part of the leg. Almost, uh, almost nobody pick like the posterior part of the leg, especially the upper leg. It's just too awkward to do that. And this is uh, the same patient that you saw earlier after being treated with doxepin. Now doxepin is widely used by dermatologists in low dose but in higher dose of 100 milligrams per day or higher, it is, it, it's an antidepressant. And not only that, it has tremendous anti-itch effect. And also one of the problem with depression is insomnia. Doxepin also tend to help with insomnia. So when the patient is successfully treated, and this lady was treated with doxepin 100 milligrams per day at bedtime, and she was okay with the sedation, which is the number one side effect of doxepin. Eventually, um, she stopped uh, picking on her skin because when patients recover from depression, oftentimes they find that picking is too painful. There's a theory 
that when people are depressed, endorphins, which is one of the stress hormones, can go up in some people, which might make those people indifferent to pain. So they can make holes on themselves. But once they are recovered from depression, it's too painful. They can't do it anymore. So doxepin, often starting dose is very low because sedation is a possibility. 10 milligrams at bedtime. And then you can gradually titrate the medication up. Now, uh, the, the usual antidepressant dose is 100 milligrams a day or higher for ordinary adults, uh, although it might be lower in elderly. And FDA approved doses up to 300 milligrams per day. Why? It's because there is a huge um, variation in the metabolism of doxepin. There are some hypermetabolizers where you really need to use very high dose in order to get a good blood dose. And the good thing is that serum doxepin level is available commercially. Um, you might have to look for it, but every lab does that. And what you get is doxepin and no doxepin, NOR doxepin, which is the only active metabolite. And if the blood level, which is trough blood level, at least 12 hours after the last oral dose of uh, doxepin, trough blood level is within therapeutic range, then you are fine. Now, uh, in people who are older, it's also good to check EKG. This is uh, one uh, case that I have published in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, an uh, older patient who was using doxepin not for depression, but for pruritus, scalp pruritus. And, uh, and he felt like 40 different treatment modalities, both uh, orthodox and alternative uh, medicine. And what this is showing is that as the doxepin dose go up higher, he almost made it to 300 milligrams per day. His blood level in yellow was not very good at all until we hit about higher than 250 milligram. Finally, his blood level went up. And to my knowledge, this patient was compliant all along. So he has a, he's like a hypermetabolizer and his scalp riders, which has been tormenting him for years, actually disappeared. So that's the therapeutic level of doxepin in our lab. And uh, in order to get to that, we had to slowly titrate the dose using the trough blood level as a guide. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we only go up provided the patient have no side effect. But sometimes you have to push the dose and individualize it in order to make doxepin do its therapeutic effect. Now, in terms of antidepressant, there are many antidepressants available. My favorite actually uh, if, uh, is paroxetine or Paxil because paroxetine is more relaxing, whereas fluoxetine or Prozac uh, is more activating, more sometimes anxiety provoking when you start. And uh, sertraline or Zoloft, um, it's neither activating nor sedating. Uh, so I, I tend to use um, paroxetine if it's mainly for depression, but doxepin if itching is part of the big picture. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, obsession is uh, intrusive thoughts. Compulsion is the behavioral comp component of OCD. So, uh, in dermatology, we have all kinds of compulsion to pick on the skin, pull out the hair, and acetyl uh, uh, cysteine. This is over the counter dietary supplement and uh, used according to the, the, the direction. It can help uh, the obsessive compulsive uh, tendency, including picking, pulling hair, and so forth. And the possible side effect is mainly the GI side effect, abdominal discomfort. Now, paroxetine not only is uh, FDA approved, for depression and anxiety, but also it's anti-compulsive. Only thing is to use it as an anti-compulsive agent, you often need a higher dose, up to 80 milligrams per day. And uh, side effects include sedation, sexual dysfunction, GI discomfort, and weight gain. Now, secondary psychiatric disorder, this is where 
because of the uh, embarrassing appearance of ugly skin disease, people become depressed, anxious, sociophobic, and so forth. Now, uh, because of the limitation in time, I won't go into the detail, but it's good to be aware of uh, that part of it. Cutaneous sensory disorder. Uh, this is a very nice man who had tremendous attack of itching, which uh, failed many treatments. He's been to Mayo Clinic, he's been to Stanford, uh, all kinds of treatments, including intralesional steroid and so forth. On doxepin, his itching completely disappeared. And if I, um, if, if I stop doxepin abruptly, the itching comes back. This is uh, this central nervous system uh, mediated pruritus. Now, now, when we have cutaneous sensory syndrome, uh, gabapentin is one of the safer medications to use the Neurontin. But the second line, tricyclic antidepressant, uh, relatively low dose, uh, lower dose than what we usually use for depression, anywhere from 10 milligrams per day to maybe about up to 50 milligrams per day. If the itch is the main problem, doxepin is usually uh, a good choice. If the pain is the problem, I mean, triptyline, the old brand name of Elavil, uh, actually has the most data. However, I mean, triptyline, um, it's not always tolerated. If it's not tolerated, uh, then the newer tricyclics, such as the cipramine or nopramine, is used. And then, uh, if that is somehow not tolerated or does not work, then non tricyclics, such as SSRI, can be used for cutaneous um, dysesthesia. I mean, triptyline, uh, I don't use it as much because even though most studies were done, uh, for cutaneous analgesic effect with amitriptyline, it has the most side effect. The cipramine, uh, which is a metabolite of amitriptyline, so much better tolerated. Once again, the dosage is 10 to 50 milligram da daily. Now, personality disorder. Um, it's well known that cosmetic practice, many of the patient has borderline personality or narcissistic personality disorder. It's really important to know how to recognize these personality disorders. Because if you don't know who you are dealing with, these people can wreak havoc to your practice. Um, now, finally, before I uh, run out of time, I would like to cover psychosis. And this, I'm gonna spend more time and go into more detail. Because Morgellons patients or people with delusions of parasitosis, delusional infestation, I think that's one of the biggest tragedy um, in dermatology because um, the, many of these patients uh, it's hard, uh, probably do not get the care that they need. And it's not anybody's fault really. It's the disease that is driving these people to a wrong specialist, if I may say so, meaning to the dermatologist. Um, and so that, that, uh, I like to uh, spend some time on talking about how to help these people. Now, a uh, lady put this on my desk and say, these are the parasites. I, I look at it and then I couldn't see anything. So I said, uh, sorry, I couldn't see anything. I just see water. And then she looked at me and said, of course you only see water. These parasites are invisible. You know, so uh, the point is, if somebody is truly delusional, you can't argue with them. Uh, it, it, and, and the kind of uh, the psychosis we see as dermatologists most often um, is monosymptomatic hypochondriacal psychosis. This is a terminology that's actually used more in Europe, but I think it's really a good uh, spot on kind of a terminology because these people really tend to have monosymptomatic psychosis. Uh, in psychiatry, it's also called encapsulated delusion. It's almost like a craziness in a capsule, which is very different than something like schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a multi-deficit problem where people not only have wrong idea, uh, delusional idea, but they also typically see things, hear things, 
uh, schizophrenic patients tend to have flat affect or inappropriate affect. Or, or people who become schizophrenics lose their social skill. So schizophrenia, in contrast, is, is a more global deficit. You know, whereas delusions of parasitosis or Morgellon syndrome, uh, they tend to be much more focal. And the rest of the personality, the rest of psychological function is largely normal, uh, which is actually nice for, uh, for me because uh, the, the, once you learn how to connect with these people, in honesty, I, I have to say, they're delightful people. They're not like that uh, stereotyped chronic uh, psychiatric patient where you can tell something's wrong, even if you are like 20 feet away. Um, th th these people uh, really have a focal problem. Now, not everybody talks about parasite. Um, if they talk about parasite and they don't have any, then we generally use the term delusions of parasitosis. If they talk about foreign materials coming out of the skin, like blue fiber or black dots or white dots, uh, we tend to use the word um, Morgellons disease. But um, people can have all kinds of delusions. Some people might think that they are too greasy or they're losing hair. Um, so now with all these encapsulated uh, or uh, sharply defined delusional problem, one very critical step is to distinguish between primary delusions of parastosis, DOP stands for delusions of parastosis, or the versus secondary delusions of parastosis. The, the reason is that the, uh, the primary delusions of parastosis, you know, where the condition occurs spontaneously, uh, that's the kind that uh, we really should be trying to take care of because these people uh, practically none of them want to go see a psychiatrist. And the thing that the other thing is primary delusions of parastosis, the spontaneous cases are overwhelmingly older women worldwide. Whereas secondary delusions of parastosis means delusion is secondary to other things like drug use, like uh, other medical or psychiatric illness, dementia, schizophrenia, manic depressive, psychosis, and so forth. To deal with secondary uh, delusions of parastosis, you really need a whole department of psychiatry because it all, what you have to do all depends on what the delusion is secondary to. In fact, uh, even me as a psychiatrist uh, will not try to handle secondary cases in the dermatology department because I can't, there's no way I can be a one person psych department. So I'm gonna primarily talk about primary delusions of parastosis. And officially only primary delusion parastosis is recognized as delusions of parastosis because according to the DSM-5, um, if the, the delusion about parasite or foreign material is secondary to some other broader uh, condition, you know, such as um, dementia or schizophrenia or drug use, then uh, we are not supposed to call that delusion of parastosis. We're supposed to uh, focus on the underlying uh, problem that's causing it. Now, um, the, the thing about primary or spontaneous delusions of parastosis, why is it mostly women? Not only why is it mostly women, why is it mostly older women? And there is an interesting work that is going on in Europe that suggests that this condition might in fact be organic. And uh, what the, the, uh, one of the more interesting theory with some functional MRI uh, evidence is that uh, there is a system called DAT system, which you see on the right. That stands for dopamine transport system. Now, dopamine transport system is most uh, prominent in women, not men. And it keeps the dopamine in the brain in reasonably good range. Now, that system, it, it depends on proper and adequate level of estrogen to function. 
And as the women get older and estrogen level goes down, that this DAT system in some women might actually become less functional. People end up with too much dopamine uh, because they are not as well regulated and they might end up with psychosis. You know, so uh, this is just graphically showing what's on the left is what's uh, supposed to be the proper amount of doxepin, whereas on the right, you see um, excessive uh, dopamine, which can lead to um, uh, excessive and, in, and inappropriate uh, dopamine mediated neurotransmission in the brain resulting in both tactile hallucinosis as well as uh, delusional ideation. And if this um, involves, if this process involves the part of the brain that um, that is important for transmission of sensation in the skin, then people are more likely to develop delusions of parasitosis. Um, and then at the same time, uh, they can also have the same kind of dysfunction in the frontal lobe. And frontal lobe is important for proper judgment. You know, so people who have frontal lobe compromise, even if they were given um, clear logical explanation and evidence that they don't have parasite, they might not be able to accept that or understand or comprehend um, when the frontal lobe is involved. You know, so this is one of my uh, more recent article. Um, is Morgan lens disease an organic disease? Uh, and this primarily um, summarized the structure and functional brain abnormality, which has been found uh, after uh, many people with delusions parasitosis actually cooperated with studying their brain. And uh, frontal striatal thalamo parietal dysfunction. Uh, these are the, uh, and uh, we're talking about areas that are involved in transmission of skin sensation. And as you can see, there are many different pathologies which can be found in these patients, uh, as well as, um, as I said, the frontal lobe deficit. And, and this is important because um, the, many of these patients uh, the feel that uh, they are not given proper respect. And uh, I hate to think that any of us in dermatology would not give proper respect to the patients, but I think uh, that, that, that there is a uh, possibility that if, if some condition is thought to be purely psychological, then uh, they may not get as much respect as conditions that we know is physically caused. And, and if these theories are correct, which I personally think that it's likely to be, uh, delusions of parasitosis might be just as organic condition as catching a cold. But, but the other thing is that this process is, may, is gradual in many people. Uh, in, they're not always absolutely delusional um, when they start. And this is one of my uh, paper about the spectrum of ideation in patients with symptoms of infestation. Now, what, what I'm trying to say is that in my 35 plus years of experience, many of these people start with formication only. Formication, of course, means crawling, biting, stinging sensation. And then they can, over time, begin to be very much more worried about this formication start to think about it a lot, getting more mentally preoccupied. So they could end up with the third stage that I show here, overvalued idea, but they're still not completely rigid. And then uh, beyond that, they can actually become delusionoid, which means almost delusional. In fact, uh, when they come in, delusionoid patients and delusional patients might look almost identical. And then if you get into argument with them or some kind of a conflict, then, then it's really hard to tell them apart. What, the way to tell them apart is, if I can actually have good rapport established with these patients and we really get along, then I would uh, think about the possibility of asking the question, how important is it 
that your condition is actually caused by living thing? Or, or, uh, or do you just want to get rid of this condition so you can live happy, normal life? And if they can, if they can articulate that, oh, it doesn't matter whether it's caused by living thing, even though I'm really worried about parasites and so forth, I don't care what it is. I just want to get rid of it. If somebody can say that, then technically they're not delusional. However, the next step is to actually become delusional where the only the ideas about parasite or blue fiber or whatever is acceptable. Any other suggestion, they will resent it. Uh, but, but even delusional patients where we have to be more careful as a provider uh, on the, to, in terms of how we talk to them so we don't uh, get them in a bad mood. Um, even those cases, in my experience, most of them still can accept antipsychotic medication as long as we don't present it as antipsychotic medication and they can still get better. Why? Because they still want to be better. They don't want to live like this. Now, rare patients, a real unfortunate case, have terminal delusion where they don't care about anything except for us to believe in them. It's almost like a religious extremist or something like that. Uh, now, terminal delusion patients, even I have a hard time doing anything for them. Um, now, how to manage these patients? Pimozide and Respiridone uh, and some other medications are extremely effective at low dose. So the, the, there's hope. Treatment really works. And the, the, the thing is, how do we get to take it? Now, you cannot hope to get them to accept the treatment unless you can connect with them. You know, so the, the thing about these patients is that uh, uh, naturally, I think all of us prefer to see regular patients with actinic keratosis, acne, whatever. But we cannot afford to go in looking unhappy about seeing them. So it, it's important to give very positive uh, attitude and body language. And don't worry about the medication. Initial, the, the most important thing is how do we establish rapport? So I have this stop sign because if I'm told that there's a new one of these uh, delusional patients waiting to see you, sometimes I'm behind myself already on my schedule and I don't like it. But I, but I, I dare not go in there with long face because then things can really go ugly quickly. So I stop myself if I'm not feeling that great. Sometimes I take my two hands and make my face purposely smile. And then I pretend that I'm seeing my favorite Hollywood star because it's important to start off in, in, in a, um, with a good step, even if it were part of my professional acting. And now, uh, some blood tests, especially what you see in the red, thyroid function test, vitamin B12, tox, tox screen, uh, can be helpful along with the others. But the thing is, if they are fixated on ideology, um, it, we really cannot do uh, very much. So initially, I, I still have to do uh, my due diligence, uh, looking at their specimen, encouraging um, th th them to uh, talk to me in detail, examine their skin, the, to pay, you know, to basically gain trust. But um, but on the other hand, eventually I would like to steer them to a pragmatism, um, to see if they are willing to try medications like antipsychotic on a trial and error basis. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to risk instant invalidation by saying that to the patient that, oh, you don't have parasite. Oh, don't, you know, uh, it's, it's in your head. Uh, that's not gonna work uh, in my experience very well. Um, I rather say you have a mysterious condition and uh, that we really need to get you out of this uh, awful condition and there are some medications that are known to be helpful. So the way to encourage therapy, the way that I do it, uh, is that 
at first it, it looked like they, they are only interested in validation of their delusional ideation, but in fact, they have another strong wish that drove them into your office, which is their wish to escape from this living hell. They're not having fun. In fact, people with delusions of parastosis on average are so much more miserable than people with whole body psoriasis. Uh, as some of you know, my other area of expertise is psoriasis. You know, so they're not having fun at all. They, they don't like this. So I purposely diminish the thing about validation and further exploration after I do some due diligence in looking at their specimen, looking at their skin. But, and then I emphasize the importance of escaping from this living hell. They try to be brave, but they're really miserable. And I know that, you know, so I deliberately articulate how awful this condition is, how this is like a living hell. And I find that some patients really get touched by that. You know, they say, oh, gee, you know, uh, Dr. Ku, you're the first person who really understand how awful this condition is. Uh, a lot of other dermatologists we've seen, they just told me um, that this is nothing, you know, there's nothing important and just shoo me out of the office. You know, so, and then, so I, I purposely um, motivate them to try oral medications um, by stimulating their desire to get out of their current misery. And now Pimozide is historically the most commonly used medication, brand name ORAP. And I find this medication particularly helpful uh, because it has no psychiatric indication in USA. It's only FDA indication is Tourette syndrome. You know, so I can honestly tell the patient that this is not a medicine FDA approved for, psych for psych psychiatric condition. It's, it's a medicine for Tourette syndrome that has absolutely nothing to do with you. And many people find Pimozide acceptable because of that. Um, if, now I, I could use uh, antipsychotic medication, uh, Resperidone, for example, Olanzapine, but unfortunately they all have psych indication. And nowadays, many patients uh, Google, and, and if they find that this is a medication for crazy people, not only they won't take it, but uh, their, their report with me can be jeopardized. Now it is true that Pimozide has higher risk of tardive dyskinesia than the newer medications, but the newer medications also have uh, issues that Pimozai doesn't have, which is risk of creating metabolic syndrome. And, uh, on, and, and, the, and last thing is that the Pimozai, as well as the newer medication works so well that I often need to use very low dose. So the tardive dyskinesia is very unlikely because of the low dose that is used. And people generally do not take this medication lifelong like people with schizophrenia. So worldwide in the, the whole mankind's history, the number of tardive dyskinesia reported in dermatology setting uh, with Pimozide is only one. And that's after half a century of worldwide use. So dosing, I call it trapezoid dosing. I start with very low dose, 0 0.5 milligram, which is just a half a tablet of Pimozide. Pimozide is usually small, so you can just break it in half. And then you go up by every two to four weeks. And then I would tell the patient ahead of time, don't expect any benefit until we hit three milligrams per day at least. Now, many people notice great improvement before they hit three milligrams, but I don't want them to give up prematurely. So I tell them, don't worry about if it's working or not until we walk up to three milligrams by going up by 0 0.5 milligrams every two to four weeks. So that's the increasing phase of trapezoid. And somewhere along the way, maybe even before three milligrams, they, they experience great improvement. If they experience great improvement, then I, then, uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to insist on uh, going up to three milligrams, whatever the dose that they respond is fine. And then I will keep the effective dose going until their symptom, the crawling, biting, stinging sensation clears or almost clears. 
and their mental preoccupation almost always goes down so they can start enjoying life. Now, after their symptom is virtually gone, I ask them to continue for another three to four months. Why? Because if I try to pre, uh, discontinue or taper too soon, I find that some patients have recurrence and that's very discouraging for the patient. So I ask them to continue the same dose three or four months or longer uh, because we're typically using very low dose anyway. And by this time, the patients think the pimozide or respiradone is God sent. They, they generally have no objection taking it longer. In fact, they are more afraid that I might take the medicine away from them. And then eventually when we taper, we go down by the same half a tablet every two to four weeks, the way, the way we came up. Now, the potential side effect of, of pimozide, or uh, before I talk about that, I, I have to put it in perspective. My experience, 35 plus years, I cannot remember the last time anybody had any significant side effect. And I think that's probably because we use so ridiculously low dose. And the reason we use ridiculously low dose is because this condition is so responsive to pimozide, respiradone, and so forth. But theoretically, stiffness or restlessness can happen. Over-the-counter Benadryl, 25 milligrams up to four times a day PRN. Uh, watch, out, watch out for sedation. Uh, that's very effective for stiffness or restlessness. But I cannot remember the last time any of my patients had to take Benadryl, but I always have them carry with them just in case. Sedation and activation, uh, that can happen sometimes. But if it's sedating, take it at bedtime. If it's activating, have more energy then take it in the morning. They get more things done. As I said, Tadaftis kinesia, only one case reported in dermatology setting after half a century of use. Uh, so it's very unlikely. Uh, now, uh, EKG, I think it's good to check if the patient is old. Now, the definition of you know, what is old, I, I put typically 50 plus, and that's been conservative. Um, but basically, it, it, it's, it's good to do it anyway. Um, and what you're looking for is increased QT interval and silent arrhythmia. Uh, and, and how many of the, my patients have those? Practically none, but it's good to check. And, uh, and then also um, the, the hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia can cause. So the initial lab, I think it's good to also check uh, this electrolytes mag and magnesium. Now, alternative to pimozide. Uh, if patient cannot tolerate pimozide or they're on the medication that interact with but uh, there, there are several medications uh, that are available, uh, olanzapine. Uh, but by far, my favorite is respiradone or respiradol. The dosing is the same uh, and also the, uh, the trapezoid kind of dosing. Higher risk syndrome, lower risk of tardive dyskinesia. So that is the psychosis part of the whole psychodermatology, but, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, I have given you enough information that you can actually try to give them the, the treatment they really need, uh, which is antipsychotic or pimozide, which is anti. Now, it is psychotic uh, in some reference book because chemically, uh, it is similar to the other antipsychotic, but once again, in United States of America, it is not used as a uh, antipsychotic. And we know that there are many anti-nausea pills, uh, for example, and many antihistamines that also have chemical structures similar to antipsychotic, like, uh, but we don't usually think of icomposine as antipsychotic. So uh, th that's, I, I personally uh, present pimozide once again as medication with no psychiatric FDA indication. It's Tourette syndrome medication and Tourette syndrome have nothing to do with them. Now, uh, if anybody uh, face one of these patients, uh, feel like trying to treat them, but 
in my faculty at UCSF, and there is an official UCSF function, which is called UCSF Second Opinion. Um, and uh, there is a one-time fee. I don't think insurance uh, covers this, but patients might find it worthwhile. Then I can officially review the case um, and then uh, give you guidance and hopefully also give you uh, endorsement on treating this because I understand uh, dermatologists who have never used Respedone or Olanzapine. And uh, there is a book that I wrote with my fellow um, who helped me put together this uh, presentation, Dr. Nicholas Brownstone. Um, and uh, he's going to get to be a, a derm resident in Philadelphia with Temple. And his book and my book, our book, uh, which goes into great detail, everything I talked about is available. Thank you for your attention. Take care. Bye.